Yeah, no, one really great thing about this event is, you know, it goes from being a physical event that kind of just takes stories from New York or New Jersey. And now we get all of these great stories from all over the country and we get to bring everyone together here uh, to share. Our next presenter is Cindy Nguyen, uh, who's from Providence, Rhode Island, by way of Garden Grove, California. Cindy is a filmmaker, historian of Vietnam and an educator at Brown University. Hey, Cindy. Uh, she makes visual Hi. art about intergenerational language, love and translation. Uh, due to the current COVID-19 situation, she is physically separated from her family across the East and West Coast. Uh, she put together the story footage uh, in hopes to transcend their physical and temporal di distance uh, and to remember the bright and joyful moments of her family's past and hope for time when she can be uh, reunited with her family again. Great, so let's take a look at her video. My family speaks a particular linguistic formula of 1990s Little Saigon Vietnamese. We just moved here, but my modai, the market has a sale, five pounds of apples for one buck. Jot and go sale, nam pound tao cho mo buck. Today is Christmas. Hôm nay là Christmas. It's a familial language of living history. And it was a language that I was raised on. Before I found my time structured by recess and English grammar, I absorbed the world around me. I helped my mom cut away the loose threads of our day's garment work. I watched Vietnamese children's karaoke, Thaeje, and learned about sweeping the house, playing with fireworks, and cooking for your grandparents. Sitting cross-legged on the floor, I traced my mom's handwriting of my name, Nguyen Thi Kim An. Utterances of sacrifice, duty, and reputation inserted themselves between meals and commercial breaks. These were the Vietnamese words that guided my every day. But then I started to learn a new language at school. This language had other rules, speech patterns, and ideals. It was unlike the Catholic creeds my grandmother whispered or the ethics of family forever first. New authority figures who did not look like my parents told me, good job, you can be whoever you want to be. Everyone is different. Cindy has a flat nose. Teacher, you plagiarized. Your English essay is too good classmate you are a communist and i would say no i'm not i came to america on a boat and then everyone would laugh a different set of pronouns and names governed my existence at school i was a neutral pronoun i and the newly chosen name cindy Nguyen, i would enunciate slowly each day during roll call yes it's okay you don't need to bother with my real name at home, I was child, gone, and the affectionate term of endearment, little one, bear. I never questioned if I was fluent in English or Vietnamese until that stale suburban afternoon during my third grade parent-teacher conference. When my mom screeched, my children talk English good. She not ESL, she do good job in school. I remember it very clearly as a screech because all the little hairs along the back of my neck stood on end. I replayed in my head, not what my mother said, but how she said it. I wanted her to stop speaking because it resembled the scratching of distorted static, the slow undoing of Velcro shoes, something I yearned for during Catholic confession, something I feared. She sounded foreign, bizarre, comedic even. That day, I learned that the English language could be something called broken. All right, thanks so much for sharing that with us, Cindy. I loved uh, the family footage that you were able to incorporate. Um, and I also found so much of the imagery of your words to be so strong. Like the analogy with the Velcro shoes was like super powerful. It like stopped me in my tracks. 
Like, how do you think that moment shaped your life? Yeah, I think that, well, I originally wrote this piece when I was living in Vietnam. Um, and at that time I was confronting my language capacity and where that was coming from. And I think at first, because like, I was born in a refugee camp in Pulau and I grew up most of my time in Little Saigon, Orange County, California. And that, like for me, I was so surrounded by a very specific like formulation of Vietnamese that's so tied to my family, to the 90s, to this, to growing up, to going through ESL and all of that. And I think when I was writing it and like living in Vietnam and reflecting back, I remember confronting this tremendous sense of loss and this interwoven relationship between language and loss. I felt like I had lost something from my past because I could not express the adult version of Cindy that I wanted to express. And at first, when I wrote this piece, it just, it felt really heavy and I, and I think I needed to go through that. But when I finally kind of thought more about this special artifact or living archive of, of our 90s Vietnamese formulation, I started to feel just the sense of like bittersweet celebration of those textures of our language. Like for example, I thought the word like to move is move. Like I didn't think that when I was speaking in Vietnam, I was like, or Vietnam, Vietnam, I'd be saying like, oh yeah, um, and then like, they're like, move, what's that? And I'm like, that's Vietnamese uh, or things like other words like box instead of box instead of box. So it's just like, I started to feel proud of that formulation and to recognize just how language changes and transforms and you could re-imbue that with a new relationship as you just grow up and become an adult. Mm -hmm. um, and you had mentioned just now, uh, like moving from California and now you're in Providence, Rhode Island. Like what's, what have you found to be like the biggest changes from moving from one place to the other. I've kind of had like a similar situation, even though it's within the same state of going from a place that kind of like it has a lot of opportunities uh, to connect with Vietnamese Americans to a place that maybe not so much. Um, how have you found that transition? And do you feel like you have found your own like Viet community there? I find, I find that I'm finding my community right here, right now in a special way too. Um, mm -hmm. And I find that the physical movement, uh, I mean, I've been away from Little Saigon for decades now when I left to college and then I went to pursue my PhD and then I moved to Vietnam. And then now I'm at, in Providence, Rhode Island because I, uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow and I teach Vietnamese history at Brown. So for me, creating community is, I mean, there's two parts to that. First is like the creation aspect and the community aspect. So the mm -hmm. creation like happens um, in so many novel ways. Like when I had the chance to teach my students about Vietnamese history and the power of narrative and learning about, a lot of my students actually are of Southeast Asian heritage and I teach about history of Southeast Asia. And it's so empowering to have that moment that we are creating and understanding together a new narrative of history and understanding its complexity. And then the other side, which is community, I find um, the chance to just connect. I mean, I connect with people in. Uh, the Viet community it's in Boston, which and there's a Boston Providence uh, rivalry that I'm just familiarizing myself with. Maybe Boston mm -hmm. doesn't recognize us, but that's okay. Um, and I think it's just like, I think what is really cool about this community aspect is wherever I am, I've been able to connect with people from all over from like my time um, in Vietnam and getting involved in like the poetic arts community there, being here and connecting with all of you. Um, and I think it's like the ability to move between places that gives us that time to really um, think about movement and language in a very unique way where it's not just like the physical movement between things, but it's like how we talk about that movement and how we think about it. So um, I'm hoping that like in the time that I'm at Brown, I'm actually producing a longer poetic documentary arts film called Translating Across Time and Space that meditates on this notion of movement and the words that we use to describe that movement from like mu to vut bien, which was like so much, that was the only type of movement that I knew about growing up because it was about border crossing, but I didn't know it was border crossing because that was a specific mm -hmm. word. I just thought that's how everybody moves. Um, so it was just like this notion that these words from Kwe and home 
Phật Long biết ơn, they all have this different texture to it that is tied to a time and a place. So Cindy, I, when I was in school, there were not many Vietnamese professors. So I'd love to hear the one thing that you hope you bring to your students or that they take away from being in, a, in one of your courses. It's, it's been a really hard time to be a teacher right now. I mean, to be any a human right now, honestly. Um, but I think after teaching through and during the pandemic, something I really, really hope that my students carry it through from my class is the opportunity to learn to cultivate compassion. Because I find that that's what history is. It's the ability to understand the context, the complexity, to recognize that there's all these different kind of causal factors that shape who people are and how they respond to a specific moment. And it takes a tremendous surrender and confrontation with your own maybe biases or your own limitations of knowledge to just recognize that, wow, people have gone through completely different experiences than I have. And I'm only barely scratching that surface of understanding. But by coming with this like generous spirit of compassion, I could better just understand others, but also myself. Yeah, we're also getting a lot of uh, comments in the chat about folks wanting to take your class, but I know they can't. But if you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you could maybe uh, <laughs> give us some, a recommendation for kind of like essential quarantine reading, um, we'd love to hear maybe maybe one, one or two things that you think we should be reading. Ooh. Oh, that's hard. Um, well, I actually, I try to make a lot of my work open source too. So if you just search me and I can put a link to my academic website too, where I have my talks and different types of course materials. Great, please do. Um, yes, yeah, so that's cindyawin.com. Um, central reading right now. See, this is really bad because I'm a historian and I'm telling you to not read for a second because I think we're kind of inundated with a lot of stuff right now. And I find that maybe instead of reading to just kind of take a pause and have conversations that we've delayed ourselves, like pushed away from. So if that's like a conversation with our, yeah, like with our parents or with ourselves. Yeah. yeah, I find like that's, I'm a, I'm a bad professor because I told you not to do the reading, but I think it's just, um, there's a lot going on in the world. And I think to have the conversation and to come to that with somewhat of an open mind is really important right now. No, absolutely. I think that's a great recommendation for us um, is to just open up and have those conversations. I feel like that's so much about what uh, the mission of the Both People podcast is too, is about being able to start those conversations with people you care about. Great. Thank you so much, Cindy, for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you, Cindy.